Hello, everybody, and welcome back to SciBite, where we dig our way into the latest discoveries in technology in the world of science and then try to dig our way back out. I am your host for SciBite, Jeremy, and joining me on the Skype line as every week is the lady with all the brains, Mars <laughs> Base or Heather. Hi, guys. Today we're going to look at antimatter, uh, what it is, how they capture it, detect it. Now, one of the things that's led us to be talking about this is actually, uh, very recently, mm -hmm. a study has been launched up to the International Space Station, right? Uh, yes. That's the, uh, is that the AMS? Am I remembering this correctly? Yes. The um, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. This is the second one that's gone up. All right, great. Well, we'll be talking about that specific study in just a little bit, as well as mm -hmm. a few other studies that are actually looking into the nature of antimatter itself. But I think we should probably start off by explaining to the good peeps at home, and me, because I don't really know, what antimatter is. Can you kind of lay off some science in our faces on this one, Heather? Well, before we jump into antimatter itself, let's look at how it was discovered, where it kind of came from. Mm. Back in 1928, a man named Paul Dirac... Uh, formulated an equation. Now, all he was trying to do was provide a description of electrons to fully account for relativity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of viewed math as poetry. So he wanted to pull it all oh, together. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, but he came up with a certain equation that in kind of inferred that there were these things called, well, that we later knew were called positrons, right? Basically yeah. an, an anti-charged electron. Yeah, well, the math that he, uh, the equation that he created was describing electrons. Mm -hmm. But as they looked at it, they realized just like the square root of four can be positive or negative two, they realized that the equation was describing something that could have two different charges. So that's kind of where the idea of matter with an opposite charge, an opposite spin, could really be exist. And he actually came up with this way back in 1928. So the concept, at least at a high level, of antimatter has actually existed for quite some time, mm -hmm. even though the actual studies relating to it are a pretty recent development in science itself. Mm -hmm. Has anybody else, uh, now he kind of equated, he figured out the math on, uh, that kind of put people on the path to this, but he's not the discoverer of antimatter no. itself, Paul Dirac. So uh, where did it actually come from? Now the person who's sort of, cre sort of credited with the discovery is a man named Carl David Anderson. He discovered the positron and kind of coined the, the phrase of positron. It's the anti-electron. Now, is in Anderson 19... the one that actually got the credit in the Nobel Prize for considering this? He is the one who got the credit and shared a Nobel Prize for this. He got that in, uh, he, got, he discovered it in 1932. Mm -hmm. um, now, what it was is it was, this, uh, it was a study in, at a magnetic field, and they were looking at electrons, and he noticed that something with the mass of an electron went through his experiment but it bent the wrong way. It bent in an opposite direction that he thought it should based on its charge. So he wasn't actually trying to discover positrons necessarily, at least no. not when he started. It was no. just something he noticed and then followed up on? Yes, and in fact, once other people saw this and looked back at their data, mm -hmm. it had actually shown up in other studies before in people oh, either Oh, I bet just, they were kicking themselves. They just kind of blew it off as, you know, oh, that was a weird bat bit of data or... What's wrong with this? Uh, something must be wrong. Oh, man. So. Wouldn't you hate to be that guy? Oh, they yeah. could have gotten the Nobel Prize two years earlier. <laughs> 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 okay, so now we know a kind of where it came from, and the mm -hmm. concept of antimatter has then been around since officially since uh, the early 30s. Yes. Um, still, not a whole lot of studies done in that area. We will, like I said, get to a few that are being conducted as we speak, and actually within the past few months there have been some major breakthroughs on the, on the subject of antimatter. Um, but why don't we um, now... Now that we've covered the history and everybody knows where it came from, let's tell everybody exactly what antimatter is. Antimatter is the mirror image of matter. For every matter particle, you're going to have a matching antimatter particle, something with an opposite charge, an opposite spin. Mm. If you remember from science class, electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive charge. Right. Now, in antimatter, those are switched. And the way that the atoms spin are also flipped. So something going... Oh, the actual orbits of the individual Yes, bits? the actual orbits of the bits will spin the opposite direction. So is antimatter yes. actually made of... Do we know this? Do, are, are they made of anti-quarks? Or are they made up of the same bits, just in different orders? Well, we believe that it's anti-quarks. But hmm. really, it's just recently that we've been able to trap antimatter long enough to be able to study it to any degree, which oh. we'll get to 
in a in a little bit later in the episode. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So we don't actually know entirely what their substructure is. We just know basically how antimatter um, particles behave, but not really necessarily what causes them to. That's cool. We might be mm-hmm. finding that out in the very near future then with this, mm-hmm. uh, with some of the studies we'll talk about here in just a minute. Yep. So, uh, but it wasn't until 1955, our show, to, show notes say, I'm just stealing your brain because you wrote these show notes. That's 1955 okay. that the anti-neutron and anti-proton were both discovered. Mm-hmm. So again, relatively recent in the world of science. This is not something that's been around since the ancient Greeks or something like that. This is breaking new ground. Now, if you remember that I mentioned Dirac a few minutes ago and his equation, that's the what gave us the idea of two oppositely charged atoms. Mm -hmm. What it also stated was that when you combined their masses, the mass itself negated. And if we remember Einstein and the E equals MC squared, it means that a great deal of energy was released. So when these two, matter and antimatter, combine, Mm -hmm. they negate the mass of each other, they dissipate and release a great deal of energy. Right. Now, this is what they always talk about in Star Trek. I mean, I don't want to bring up too much sci-fi into a hard <laughs> science talking, but the, that's, that's the basis of how they get their engine for their warp drive is they smash antimatter against matter mm-hmm. and then filter it through a dilithium crystal matrix and blah, blah, blah. But that's the core of the explosion is caused by that energy amount. Mm-hmm. Now, this is actually also one of the worries that some of these recent st- studies into antimatter have included capturing and containing antimatter. And yes. there have been people worried out there that if you're holding on to big amounts of antimatter, you're going to destroy the universe. It's just going to it's going to explode and rip a hole in the earth. Right. Well, while it is true that half a gram of antimatter has the explosive force of 20 Hiroshima bombs. Boom. At our present production rate, it would take about a billion years to make oh, a billion with a B. Is that all? Yes. <laughs> to make half a gram. To, at make our ha- <laughs> to make that half a gram. Okay, so no sweat. Don't worry about yeah. the explosions, Everything people. we've made up until now, like combined, wouldn't even light up a light bulb. Ah, oh, we suck at this then. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we can't create enough antimatter to amount to a hill of beans, but is there any place in the, in the known universe that we know of that antimatter just exists naturally or that we think it might exist? Yes. Yes? Uh, yes. Uh, the Van Allen belt, if you remember, uh, the radioactive plasma around Earth, and we've even seen, you know, a similar thing around Jupiter. Mm-hmm. These, uh, con- this plasma contains antimatter. So we, we know that for certain already? Yes, we've been able to, be able, what you can see is you can see it interacting with matter and providing uh, the light or the energy, and you can sort of indirectly observe from a distance. That now, just to, to explain the Van Allen belt real quick, it's basically um, plasma from the sun primarily that gets caught within the magnetic field of, of large objects. We know there's one around Earth. Yes. Like you said, we've seen one around Jupiter. Is it possible that every planet has its own version of a Van Allen belt? Well, it would require a planet to have a, magnetic, a strong enough magnetic field. Not uh, all planets do. They need right. a, a molten uh, metal core that's spinning in order to create a magnetic field strong right. enough. Now, is there enough, to, or does science even know, is there enough antimatter floating out there in these Van Allen belts that could potentially be harvested for the purposes of, not, I'm not talking about fueling our warp drives, you know, pipe dream, but I'm talking about actually for just doing science on it. Is there enough out there that we could find a way to magnetically harvest it and bring it back to Earth and use it for anything? Well, I mean, it's hard to say what the future will, will bring us. I mean, we're just now being able to hold it for any length of time where we create it. It has no velocity um, you know, it's hard to catch something that's flying away from you. Especially when you, you can't, can't touch, touch it. it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, another place that this has been, uh, I, I actually learned this because, of, you know, we used to do Jupiter at night. We were always on the, on, on the lookout for weird stories to talk about. There was one that came out earlier this year, uh, I think about January, sometime like that, that scientists have, had discovered that thunderstorms actually create antimatter. I, I don't know how much. I don't, I don't remember looking into it. Do you uh, have the information on exactly uh, how this happens and uh, whether or not this is a, a viable m- path of study for uh, future antimatter discoveries? Sure. What they have seen is, you know, obviously thunderstorms produce an electrical field mm-hmm. and electrons can be accelerated upwards from that field. Now they're accelerating as they leave the atmosphere and the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner they accelerate faster and faster because they have less to push against. Like they less actually, drag, yeah. Less drag. It actually approaches the speed of light. Whoa. Now, when you have those electrons strike an atom, that atom emits a gamma ray photon. 
Now, we think that there's about 500 of these gamma ray flashes a day on Earth. Whoa, per from day? thunderstorms. Per day. Just electrons shooting off the planet at the almost the speed of light? Yes. That's crazy. Yep. But it's, then, it's, it's actually their interaction as they leave that creates yes. this antimatter, right? That is correct. And then the gamma ray flashes, there's a chance that after, you know, an electron is hit an atom, the gamma ray photon gets shot off, and there's a chance for that to hit another atom. And if that hits another atom, it produces an electron and a positron. Oh, it kind of splits them off into their, into their component pairs? Yes, it splits it off into a pair. Wow. Is that uh, similar to the, the means that they actually use in labs to create uh, antimatter for the purposes of studying? Is, is anything like that? Shooting gamma rays at stuff? That just sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, that's always some of the ways. I mean, there's radioactive decay and things of that nature. So they have various options, which we'll get to here in you a know, sec. You've mentioned radioactive decay. I think it's important, actually, if we can sidebar for just a minute, while we're, before we talk about the actual studies that are being, doing, being done on uh, antimatter, I think it might be interesting to just tell people some of the reasons that this, that this science is being done. Um, one of the primary uh, reasons, uh, we already use positrons, which are antimatter, in medical procedures to this day. There are these things called PET scanners, um, uh, positron ET scanners. <laughs> positron emission tomography. That's the one. Now you that got it. That is the one. So um, in the medical field, you can use ion therapy, if you've ever heard of that. Ions are kind of protons. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, and it also can be used to treat certain types of cancer. Oh, using like uh, using positrons or, or antiprotons or something like that? That is correct. Oh, interesting. So the more we can learn about trying to uh, not only uh, know what they're made of and how they work, but actually like containing them and mm -hmm. utilizing them in every day, we could potentially come up with new treatments to existing ailments. Yes. And now, there's obviously and, the fuel use. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it makes a boom. So if we could find a way to create enough antimatter, that could potentially be a fuel, a uh, good source of fuel. The thrust to weight, so how much oomph you get for how much you carry with you, is much higher than conventional uh, spacecraft's conventional uh, So you need methods. like less fuel, basically. We've talked about this on a previous mm -hmm. Jupiter at night again, was like it, the, the longer you want to go with fuel, the more you have to carry. To, so the more you yeah. have to use and thrusting off and, and stuff like that, it's all a compound thing. Yeah. So antimatter weighs less for the amount of thrust you could potentially generate from it, and therefore mm -hmm. you have to carry less fuel, or at least it, it weighs less. And lastly, of course, aside from all of its actual practical applications for using antimatter is, I mean, this is still an area of science that is relatively an unknown. As I mentioned just earlier in this episode, we don't actually know for certain whether antimatter is created using the fundamental building blocks of the universe that we already know about, you know, quarks and, and muons, gluons, et cetera, et cetera, or if it's actually made from a whole different set of anti-quarks or something else. And that is actually something that the guys over at CERN have just started working on. Now, CERN, you probably know, is the home of the Large Hadron Collider, but it's also the home of other um, very important research going on, on on other things, including Alpha. Alpha, the anti-hydrogen laser physics apparatus. This thing is creating anti-hydrogen. Oh, so not just just in not individual just, positrons, but actual not just molecules. Not positrons or electrons, but making anti-atoms. Nice. So they start off, they create antiprotons, they create them mm -hmm. um, by, through an accelerator by smashing high energy protons into a stationary target and then slow and uh, cool down what they get from that and trap it in electromagnetic traps and they can get antiprotons from that. Uh, okay, let me, let me make sure I'm following you. They can actually turn a proton into an antiproton? Like by freezing it, basically, getting it so cold that you can then smash things against it and reverse its spin? Well, if you, smash, if you smash a proton mm -hmm. at extremely high speed into an atom, mm -hmm. a stationary target, then from that, like we were talking about earlier, the electrons hitting atoms at extremely high speed created antimatter. This is the same type of idea. Oh, okay. You take a proton and you smash it against an atom at near the speed of light you know, extremely fast speeds, and then you can create an antiproton. And then, I mean, it's, but it's shooting off at a very fast rate then. So you mm. have to slow it, cool it. You want to cool it so it'll be a little calmer, slow down, help it slow down, and you can store it. And so then. just like you mentioned earlier, it's easier to trap something that's either not moving or moving extremely slowly mm -hmm. rather than having to, like, 
catch up to it, especially when you can't touch it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so these so guys are they, not only creating these anti-hydrogen and anti-proton and anti-electrons, but they're also, uh -huh. they've also come up with ways to contain them, again, without yes. touching them. Are they yep. using uh, like a magnetic field? Am I understanding yep. that? Mag magnetic traps. So you create a magnetic field that mm -hmm. essentially creates a, a bowl where these, um, where the anti-protons will sit. You know, they just create an opposite, I mean, the same charge. And if you remember, you know, magnetic opposites attract similar right. forces repel right so you put something that has the similar charge of an anti-proton and then it it's kind of trapped in a in a bowl of magnet so a hydrogen atom is created of a proton and an electron so an anti-hydrogen would right. be anti-proton which we now have in our magnetic bowl mm -hmm. and anti-electrons or positrons those are created through radioactive sources and accumulated and cooled in, in similar you know magnetic tra super cooled traps and then they just kind of put them together and they become friends or, or do they have to like force them together somehow? No, I mean, you mix them. I mean, you mix them and they'll want to, their charges are such that they want to pair up and create these, mo the anti-hydrogen molecule. Isn't that nice molecule. of them? I know. <laughs> now, once you have them and once you have them trapped, um, mm -hmm. what, what is the Alpha Project intending to do with this? Actually, uh, we, uh, we should congratulate them. I mean, just like four or five days ago, they released uh, an announcement that mm -hmm. they had managed to trap a significant amount of, anti well, you know, significant by modern standards, amount of anti-hydrogen for more than 16 minutes. 1,000 seconds. Uh, 1,000 seconds. Now, 16 I was, minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, considering the fact that I had previously learned that the amount of containment that we could do on antimatter was measured in like nanoseconds, mm -hmm. uh, this seems like a major leap forward in the study of antimatter in, in my opinion. And I think there's probably over the people over there drinking champagne by the bottle, by the case, <laughs> <laughs> after having figured this out. But I did yeah. check out their website and apparently they're uh, actually aiming for the mark of 2000 seconds before mm -hmm. they can start doing some significant studies on the antimatter itself. Do we know much information about what exactly they're planning to, to uh, study, what exactly they're propositioning once they have the containment um, to that 2,000 second mark? Have they announced what exactly they're going to start doing with the antimatter? Yeah, they have two major experiments planned. One, to see how these anti-atoms, anti-hydrogen, how it interacts with light. So they can, you know, shine lasers into their magnetic bowl and see how the, at these anti-atoms react to light. And the other is, how do they react to gravity? Ooh. Now, being on Earth, seeing how they react to gravity in their magnetic bowl, a little bit trickier. Right now, they hold this magnetic bottle to just half a degree above absolute zero. Jeebus, is, that's really cold. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> negative 272 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Now, the, to, in order to run the experiment on how it interacts with gravity, it needs to be within a few thousandths of a degree above the absolute zero so they have to manage to find a way to make this even colder than than one degree beyond absolute zero yes geez uh, now you mentioned earlier though how it interacts with light uh wouldn't that potentially i mean we're talking about tiny tiny little things that could potentially even be moved by photons by light um couldn't that uh screw up the the actual containment itself by shining a laser into it, they're going to have to figure out a way to, if I understand correctly, shine the laser without upsetting the actual um, magnetic containment of some sort, right? Yeah, well, they have to, you know, get it installed, and then it, that's, the, that's the question, is just, now that we have these atoms that we can hold them for long enough, now we poke them and prod them and see what do they do in different situations. We're throwing we science at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, the guys at Alpha are not the only ones that are getting their fingers in the, in the pot of antimatter here. As I mentioned at the top of this episode, we recently, actually just May, last month, launched uh, a project known as the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. NASA sent this up to the International Space Station where it's going to be doing some uh, experiments in the near future, again, on antimatter using, uh, using different technician um, techniques, uh, detection techniques than you can use on Earth, obviously, because you're in space. Um, do we have information exactly on what they're going to be trying to do on this, uh, the, the AMS project? Yeah, they're going to be searching for unusual types of matter by me measuring cosmic rays and, you know, various types of, just trying to see what kind of exotic materials they can see out there that includes antimatter. Mm. It's actually, and actually, I mean, it's already tracked its first particles, sort of, you know. Hey, already? Already? Wow. 
That's quick work. Now, uh, you mentioned it's looking for exotic matter. Does that include like dark matter like we talked about a few episodes ago as well? Well, it could be. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not sure the details of what apparatus they, they're holding on to. Right. You know, but it's so science. What exactly so anything they figure out is going to be good for us. Yes. <laughs> now, the Ames only went up on the shuttle Endeavor last mm-hmm. month. So it, it took place, you know, May 16th, May 19th. It was installed. So it's only been up for about a month. You know, they've actually had... They've actually seen a first particle, so they have some initial data. But since it's only been up a month, we don't have full test results. But it's something we should def- we'll definitely be keeping an eye on. Yeah, actually, the, you and I will probably be keeping an eye on to see if we want to talk about it again on a show here. Now, uh, if you guys are interested in any of these projects that we've talked about, there are so many links in our show notes. You thought we had links last week? Oh, my goodness, we got links this week. There are so many studies out there talking about antimatter. This seems like a really kind of a hot-button topic right now because so little is relatively known compared to some other topics out there. But, again, scientists are way into social media. We've got Twitters. We've got Facebooks. If you want to follow these individual projects, projects on your uh, social media of choice you absolutely can and they'll probably put up pretty pictures and stuff like that it'll be awesome you can get your geek on all over the internet and you don't have to settle for just these scientific projects for getting your geek on you've also got us you can head on over to jupitercolony.com and join our our active community of other fellow science geeks uh, as well as for any of our other shows that we've got going on over at jupiter broadcasting and you can follow each of us on twitter why don't you go ahead and, and lay your handle there on them heather you can follow me at JB underscore Mars base. Great. And I am JB, no underscore, Jeremy. You can also leave a note for us wherever you're watching this episode or email us at SciBite at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Oh, of course. I almost, I almost always forget that email address. So thank you for reminding me. And uh, so coming up next week, I do want to warn you guys that we're going to be taking a week off. Aw, insert sigh here the summer's coming up though and we've got something really good planned for the following week um we're going to be looking are you ready for this now i had to i want to tell you that i had to twist heather's arms uh to be able to do this (laughs) subject she was not all that enthusiastic about it but this is a subject that's very close to my heart uh and so when we come back we'll be talking about the science of barbecuing just in time for the beginning of summer so that includes like a uh, difference between charcoal cooking with charcoals and cooking with gas. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun guys just in time for the beginning of summer. So join us for that in two weeks time. And until then, everybody, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of SciBite, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. <laughs>